<clears throat> so it is Wednesday, September 11th, the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. I happen to be in New York. This is a, uh, a Rex check-in call for September of 2019. And, uh, and yeah, here we are. <laughs> um, where is Eric? Oh, you're at home. Jamey is in San Francisco walking. Uh, Dave, you're at home, it looks like, at home in the beautiful <clears throat> gorge that is actually uh, your living room. All virtual. And, and, and like all the artifacts are kind of gone. It's good. It's like you look solid in there. <laughs> no longer okay. looks like it no longer looks like a part of your mountain is flying away. <laughs> so I think that's good. And Todd, where are you now? I am sitting at home. <clears throat> Rocking. <clears throat> awesome. How is anybody? <laughs> Um, the last week seems to have been consumed, at least in my communities, a little bit <coughs> by the whole Joey Ito, Jeffrey Epstein shenanigans at the MIT Media Lab. And I keep reading sort of deeper and deeper analyses of it, uh, commentary on it. And when I think I've sort of heard enough, then I read something else. And I'm like, oh, that's new. That's interesting. That's kind of worrisome. <laughs> yeah. Has that affected anybody else on the call in any, any ways? Well, Jerry, I've been reading the posts on, the, on, on your retreat listserv. Um, it, it's, it, it's definitely pushing buttons that are much larger than just the issue itself. Uh, and I'd be curious as to what you think those buttons might be. <laughs> Um, buttons within these communities, you mean? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Todd, you, Todd, to you just froze. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. Bo? Bob Frankston was interesting. His uh, thing behind about. the opinions is significant. Uh, Todd, you're going to have to repeat what you said because you froze for a moment for us. Uh, the amount of feeling <clears throat> behind the opinions being expressed seems larger than the context of the issue itself. Yes, yes. In particular, Tom's post to the list was like, whoa, and I, I almost posted right behind him, <clears throat> dude, you know, cool your fucking jets. Um, and then Pete replied with this beautiful, heartfelt, like absorbing the blow and reversing it perfectly in a way that allowed Tom to come back perfectly. And then I'm like, well, okay, that worked pretty well. <clears throat> and my hat's, my hat's off to Pete for, for doing that so, so beautifully, so. Sorry for anybody listening to this, if it's obscure, but I'm kind of trying to preserve some of the anonymity of the, of the people who are involved. But there was an interesting exchange on, on a mailing list I run about this whole Joey Ito situation and kind of what it implies and whether it was evil or just bad, uh, how, that all, how that all goes. Todd, are you gonna jump in? Look, you look like you wanted to say something else about it. No, no. Um, and I would check in if I make sure my dog is not going to attack anyone. Be right back. Okay. <clears throat> and I apologize. I have the beginnings of a of a cold. I think not not such a fun thing on the on the road. Um, I can I can take a quick minute to just comment on the Ito, please um, Jeffrey Epstein thing. Is I feel like Neo in the Matrix, you know, dodging bullets right and left. And I realize just how many people I am like one or two degrees of separation away from are deeply enmeshed in this bit. Yep. And fortunately, fortunately, nothing that I've been directly involved with has been an Epstein funded joint. But it's way too close to home. Yeah. And it just makes me wonder, you know, who's the next show gonna drop on? Agreed entirely. And and who else do we know that's in it? like I never would never think that person XYZ would be involved in this and yet there he is. Right. And then we know people like Lawrence Lessig, who is an awesome lawyer and tries really, really hard to save civilization and protect the commons, <clears throat> uh, who wrote a dumb, I think a dumb letter justifying Joey's taking the money. And it's like, oh man, that's just not good. And there's a, there's a sort of a, a, a series of breaches of trust that are happening in the middle and, and a piece of it 
that's kind of behind the scenes is, you know, is all money, is all, are all big pools of money tainted in some way because they're, they're mostly ill-gotten gains, which may be a very Marxist thought, I don't know. Um, and if so, which ones are okay to take, uh, to take you know, money from? Should you take money from Altria, the renamed Philip Morris? <clears throat> uh, should you, you know, uh, should you take, uh, the Koch brothers invest a lot in women's issues, trying to make the world better for women. Should you take, you know, their money for women's issues? And then I'm reminded that the Women's Tennis Association, the very, very first women's tour, the very first women's uh, tournament was funded by, this will ring a bell when I say it, Virginia Slims. Oh, yeah. That was in the movie. I remember that. Only sponsor they could find. That was in the Bobby Riggs uh, versus Billie Jean movie. <clears throat> Only sponsor they could find was cigarettes. And it became the Virginia Slims tour of tennis back in a more innocent era. <laughs> Innocent, or shall we say, more worldly, perhaps less innocent. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. I don't know. So, so and, and also, all these companies are just so desperate and thirsty for funding that, you know, executive directors are basically spending most of their time with wealthy people trying to figure out how to pry them loose of their money. And then we have behind it the other thread <clears throat> of... Um, corporations are now directing a whole lot of basic research in universities. Whatever basic re research is left has become more occupational or more development directed. <clears throat> and that's kind of a problem because we've lost, um, we've lost a lot of those issues. Um, so, and I don't mean to gloss over that there's a pedophile's fortune that's sort of making its way into a cleansing machine. Um, right. Which is, uh, how can there be any doubt that what Epstein is up to is sort of cleaning his money? Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, we don't need to talk about this for long, but it's, it's been occupying a few too many of my cycles in the last week, especially since the Ronan Farrow piece came out on Saturday, basically saying, yes, everything Joey said, he didn't tell you the whole story. So it does feel, it does feel a little too close to home. Any other, any other sort of last thoughts on, on, on this, this thing? Bing. Well, no thank you to the Koch brothers for their uh, effect on America. That The brother that died, it's like good riddance. Don't let the mm. coffin hit you in the ass, asshole. Thank I, you need to I need to log off for now. Um, All right. Thanks for having me. See you in a bit. Bye -bye. Thanks, Jermaine. <clears throat> Have a good event. Um, by, by the way, Todd, you do know I'm like, uh, I, this guy you know, Philip York, he's here in Portland. I hang out with him every, occasionally. Neat guy. Are you serious? I'm serious. How did that connection happen? Philosophy. He's very. Oh, okay. Philosophy. Yes. So wow. I see him almost every week. Wow. He and I were in a men's group together for, for some time. Wow. Cool. He, he's an exceptional human being. I really like him. And yeah, I, a, lot of, a lot of depth to that man. And he likes a lot of things I like. He likes history. He likes economics. He likes, I mean, that guy is, he was fun. He's a lot of fun. Victorian era literature? Mm, yeah, well, no, he likes <laughs> French literature. Oh. Yeah, he's, he's in a steep French literature. One of, the, one of the things I ended up kind of looking, researching sideways in the middle of the whole discussion we were just talking about, hey, Susan, um, was Martin Heidegger. Um, and I know that you and Christy took a course where you studied Heidegger, Heidegger among, other, among others, but Heidegger was basically a booster of the Nazi party, et cetera, et cetera, when that happened. And it, it, you know, it affected his legacy, it affected everybody else, everything else uh, around him. And uh, Susan, I, I threw the whole Epstein, Joey Ito <clears throat> uh, affair in the, in the pond here as our opening conversation. So we're, we're sort of, I think, toward the end of it, but, but um, it has a couple of dying gasps as we as we go through it, and you know, at what point do people's really stupid decisions um, make them untouchable? At what point do we try to redeem people and bring them back into society? And and one of my beefs about today's society is that we have sort of call out culture and a, a you know off with their heads culture, where when somebody does do something wrong, we kind of want to make sure they're fired, make sure they're banished, make sure we salt the earth that they stood on so that nothing ever grows on it. <clears throat> And I don't think that's healthy for society. Oh, please go on, Jerry. That's an interesting point. Why is well, it not healthy for society? 
Well, we're seeing it everywhere. First, first of all, the obvious thing is that it has a deep and chilling effect on anybody stepping forward and saying, gosh, I made a boo-boo, right? Because if anybody making an error means it's off with their head, off with their head metaphorically, but it means that, that no one will admit error. Interesting. Right. Okay. Right. So nobody's going to step forward and say anything. And then, and then in most ancient societies, they had methods for taking the the somebody who did something wrong, whether it's stealing a chicken or murdering, you know, a, a neighbor, um, and ma incorporating them back into uh, the village's yeah. life, inducting them back into the tribe. Yeah. Right. And acknowledging the the you know the, the hurt that they've caused, uh, whatever. And and you know the Dagara tribe in West Africa would circle up around this person, <clears throat> bring family and and uh, healers and all that together, and and go at it together. Which got and and the Los Angeles police district started borrowing some of these methods for dealing with gang members. Yeah, it sounds very much like truth and reconciliation, like in South Africa. Kind of. It, ha it borrows some, some traits from there. So, so, you know, the LAPD in some one part of its life <clears throat> um, was, was trying to figure out, like, who are the top gang members who are involved in violent incidents, who are probably shooting the most people, and going to them and saying, look, we have all sorts of records on you. We know exactly who you are. We know where you live. We know you've, like, shot a bunch of people, and we would like you to stop. If you stop, we will help you come back in. Like, like a spy coming in from the cold. And if you don't stop, we're going to make sure you go like up the river for a really, really, really long time. Um, and, but, but around them was clergy, was family, and you know, their grandma was there and everybody else. And it worked a lot. It worked really well. Um, so I'm worried that we're entering a, a stage of civilization where people are more disposable, mm -hmm. um, where we don't try to do the hard work of... Um, of connecting with them and listening to things that are hard, and we don't do the hard work of reintegrating them into society. And Susan, you're muted. I think it looked like you were saying something a moment ago, but <clears throat> your mute is on. Yes, I was. Uh, I was just uh, just saying that there are a lot of us people. I mean, I think, you know, there's a sense of um, that there are always more people, right? And you see this particularly in the workplace where, you know, it, you can just go get what you want um and discard what you don't and so i don't know what that's at a root of but i keep i keep finding things that i think are perhaps a consequence of there being so many people not the ones that paul ehrlich you know came up with back in the 60s or 70s but with with just um just having more people what does that mean we talk a lot about more connectivity but I don't hear a lot of talk about just sheer numbers, which I, I sort of discounted for a long time, but I think it's time to think about. So by that, do you mean that people are more disposable then, Susan? I'm just wondering whether, I, I think people are being treated as if they were more disposable. And, and I'm wondering if that comes from, that comes from in part, this sense that there's a, oh, there are lots of people. You know, we can find, we're connected now. We can find anybody we need for what we need. Uh, we don't have to work with people and try to save them because after all, we, I'm, I'm being slightly, you know, facetious, but I'm, I'm, I think it's a, a question we should ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. And there's just another person behind them in line to perform yeah. the services they were performing or whatever. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> anybody else? Reflections on that? <clears throat> Well, and the other person in line would likely be as good, if not better, because it's yeah. not just a case of there's another body. It's just there's, there is a similar skill set because there are so many people out there because yeah. we have And they might be cheaper. I think it's an excellent point. That, and a, uh, and a clean slate. So many. Yeah. yeah. Don't have to and mess with it. Exactly. Ah, I'm getting depressed just listening to this. <laughs> well, we'll stop then. No, no, no. But I'm... I'm, I'm <laughs> The Go historical ahead. analysis around are people more disposable because I think the history of people being disposable is we got lots of examples. So I'm it's not sure how we measure that one exactly, but I, I do. I'm really interested in the idea that like the fact that we have more people somehow changes dynamics, right? Because we, we know that if you get enough of something in a system, it can change the characteristics of the system. And right. I, I think that's a really interesting question. I don't know what characteristics would necessarily change. Uh, maybe commodification. The issue. It's commodification. Right. Maybe, but I think it, all kinds of other system parts of it could change. And and back to the to the earlier question of of people being dismissed from the society, 
I think that one's really interesting, but I would argue that the restorative justice, truth and rec reconciliation, in some sense, we have a technology that, that we now kind of understand we're actually teaching and people are becoming good at it, that's being distributed, that has a tendency to bring people back into society. I don't, I don't know if it's actually gonna tip the, the process or not, but, but you can see it growing through school districts and even in the court systems and you know, it's, it's being tested and it's being studied so that there is a technological response to, to this question, I think, that you know, we're developing now. You know, in some sense, we're getting smarter, I guess. Um, I hope so. I find that encouraging. You know? And so Gene mentioned that in the list too, right? That, that we need, you know, what is the rest of re reconciliation kind of thing? And I feel like that's a, a critical issue. And when do you do it versus when do you not? And is, is, does the research reveal, uh, does the research reveal, I mean, something I would think <laughs> would project uh, would be that the, there's something about the cohesiveness of the, of the tribe or the group that they're coming back into. Does that relate to the success of the, of the, uh, a, lot, a lot of the work, as far as I know, is being, and I'm just a, a, a a passive observer, I don't know a lot of the details, but a lot of the work's being done in schools, in public schools, to try to get, reduce the number of kids that get um, suspended uh, from school. And instead of suspending them and throwing them out of the school, they go through a process that keeps them in the school. Mm -hmm. So in that case, the, the tribe is a school, I guess. Um, yeah. so I think, or a classroom, or a class. Yeah, yeah. So, because some, yeah. <clears throat> It's but it's not necessarily identified by you know race or you know, uh, country or anything like that. It's just kind of like, it's but funny, I was thinking I, about the family examples in particular. I mean, that's to be brought back into a family is a very strong thing. Yes, it's huge. Um, it's funny. Um, I don't. I don't feel, <clears throat> and maybe it's just I lead a privileged life in nice places. I don't feel a population pressure. Like suddenly, there's way too many people. And I know that in some places on earth, like there's a huge population squeeze because people are having lots of births or there's lots of in-migration of different kinds. <clears throat> but, but I'm not feeling somehow that there's more people or too many people on earth all of a sudden. That, that's, not, that's not somehow making its way onto my radar screen. I'm, I'm no, but people I, think, people I think know. Yeah. Right? Especially, I mean, thinking at the ageism, right? Um, which well, I've got several experiences with now. And uh, they just, you know, you're not wanted. Well, so the disposability part of it, I, yeah. see, I see everywhere. So, so I was just sort of trying to separate the issues a little bit. The, the okay. oh my God, we're, oh, oh my God, there's too many of us now is not resonating with me. But, yeah. the, but the, oh my God, we can just say next and just, you know, ghost yeah. somebody or, or get rid of somebody or cancel them. Uh, <clears throat> I think it was... Uh, it might have been Dana Boyd who wrote a piece on cancel culture, basically yeah. when you when you cancel someone else, right? And you just they, they just sort of don't exist. You you elide them, uh, you scrub them from your your digital presence and everything else. Um, and then digital relationships tend to <clears throat> um, they're too easy to leave, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you're in a village and you're stuck in that village for most of the rest of your life, you're kind of going to want to make up with the people around you all these digital villages and digital relationships don't really have that. Um, a brief side note, uh, I've spent a couple of days in Boston and stayed with some dear old friends who have a couple of daughters who are sort of teens and who have been struggling more than you would think with uh, addiction to Instagram and all those kinds of things and a series of, of related problems, <clears throat> um, which are insanely hard to manage, like just <clears throat> just trying to figure out what to do, uh, you know, about these kids. Um, and these are loving, humanly intelligent parents. It's all uh, like, man, how does this, um, we're, we're in a situation where the, your average youth has in hand you know, a device that has more power than any of us had in hand uh, 30 years ago. Right? With all kinds of connectivity. Oh, uh, disciplining kids. Cool. <clears throat> Mother Jones, awesome, thank you. Yeah, I, mean, wow. I think the other side of this is zero tolerance, man. And remember, yes. zero tolerance isn't just the right wing. Uh-uh, you can hear Portland's mayor say it. I mean, this B.F. Skinner thing, I think this is a deep, dark shadow in our culture that's really icky. So say more, say more about Skinnerian stuff uh, playing out now. <clears throat> 
posted it there. I'm thinking someone else in the group knows more about this than I do. Frank Darn it. But yeah, B.F. Skinner, sorry. Who's it? Don't you know B.F. Skinner? Hi. Yes, I do, but I couldn't hear you. you oh, well, <laughs> my knowledge ran out, so we're hoping you have knowledge on B.F. Skinner, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the connection you saw? For, you know, the zero tolerance, things have to be punished model of human behavior. Right. Well, we did, we did give that one up. Good. When did we give it up? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, intellectually, we sort of did. Um, but then those, those things don't make it into society, necessarily. Um, well, look, that's, there's just, it's, you know, things are rife, even in the animal kingdom, <laughs> of, uh, you know, ostrac ostracizing someone, um, throwing them out. I mean, I don't think things operate on a giant population level either, Jerry. I was, I think it's, but the, the, the units that people operate in and are, are ostracized from, um, th those are very powerful things. Um, and, and they can make somebody feel like an outsider. Right. Again, I think the operative dimensions I'm looking at are inside and outside at all these different configurations that we pass into and out of. Um, and I don't know what. I have no idea what B.F. Skinner would say about that. Yeah, yeah, me neither. I was listening to the podcast the other day, and they were talking about uh, the, you know, the fall in crime rates, right? So we've been seeing, I think, pretty much worldwide, but certainly in the U.S., pretty dramatic decreases in crime. And the guy was talking about how the uh, New York Police Department, because of the Eric Garner decision, called kind of a work slowdown. And so they were decided they were not going to arrest anybody that was unnecessary, which seemed like probably a good objective. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> you go, guys. And the crime rate dropped, you know, so the number of arrests went down and so did the crime rate. That is crazy. <laughs> it's almost for all that stuff in the 80s that Giuliani did. Hmm? This, the stop and frisk stuff, you know, clearly doesn't seem to have been all that useful. Right. And very biased. <clears throat> Extremely biased. Um, it's interesting because a lot of these things are shaping policy, right? Whether it's Carol Dweck um, and Edward Desi or nudge theory from Cass Sunstein and uh, Danny Kahneman and others or whatever people are trying to bake this into policies and what we do and and from the perspective of just Rex and trust um, these are really important things because mostly the, the the Rex angle on this is that we try to come back into relationship and that if we if we do that we can actually sort out how to behave together Oh, the sunflower seeds by um, Ai Weiwei. Yeah, I don't know, just too many people, and I don't know, just made me think about that. Have you seen the the documentary that covers the village where they make where they painted made and painted the seeds? Crazy, like amazing. And apparently, they're now selling them as souvenirs, so they're making extra, you know money after the whole after the whole event was done. Um, but it's little, it's hand painted sunflower seeds that are actually pottery. <clears throat> that, that where there are millions of them and the, enough of them that you can spread them uh, on a huge installation floor and it's an art artwork he is he is just brilliant in terms of conceptualizing art that's very meaningful have you seen has anybody seen uh, american factory i just added it to my brain this morning because something you know pinged about it and uh, it's on my list of things to watch want to want to say something about it it's on my list too yeah yeah just i mean you know i guess it's notable because the obamas are supporting it and there's a little bit of an interview after the netflix version with the obamas that is kind of confusing but whatever but uh, the but the one of the thing and the movie is about uh, a chinese company starting a factory in dayton right in a, what had been a gm uh, i think a gm uh, auto manufacturing plant yep and and it's really funny. One of the things that struck me was, oh, this is what colonialism looks like. <laughs> the Chinese are moving into wow. the United States yeah. and critiquing the American workers and trying to get them to do the work the right way, and they're not keeping up, and you know they're having to manage them. And, and it's and the, the, the documentary is very frank. I mean, they got some footage of the conversations and the the American workers and the Chinese workers would meet separately, and the management would talk to them separately, and I don't know, all kinds of interesting things. But I think I have always wondered about what the you know people talk about colonialism a lot, kind of in the worlds I'm in, and I like I never quite understood what it was. It was like, oh, this is what it means. I get it now because you know because it was happening to people who looked like me. I, it, it made it a little bit more clear. But anyway, I, I thought it was well worth watching. 
Wow, that's interesting because like the, the colonialism of one culture dominating another, David. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese coming into the United States and, and essentially treating us like a developing country. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, oh, well, I've been on the other side of this. starting to look like one. I've been, I've been on the other side of this a few times, so. <laughs> yeah. And the, even in the trailer, there's a couple of those clips <clears throat> where the, the Chinese supervisor is saying, look, <clears throat> we're, we're training them on the same things over and over again. They're not really getting it, and they're kind of slow. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also uh, some clips in the trailer, so I haven't seen the whole doc yet, but there's clips in the trailer about Chinese workers saying the pressure that we're under is incredible. Yeah. And I, well, I, there's I, been quite a response, I think, in China to this whole thing, too. So I haven't been tracking it down, but it's probably worth worth looking at. Yeah. Most of us don't like, know. They work six-day work weeks. Yeah, exactly. You know? and that's in the movie. That's a, there's an issue about that in the movie. Yeah. Well, I just was talking to a young, a young friend of mine who came back from an internship um, in, from a biotech lab in uh, Japan. And, um, and her observation was there. She, she just didn't feel she said, there just seems to be a, you know, uh, the more time you spend at work, the better. And, you know, she wanted to do her work and get out. Right. Uh, many years ago, I spent, uh, I shared a cab with a guy who was in the high end stone business. So he would sell marble and granite and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and he was regretting that um, Carrara marble is the most famous marble in the world. <clears throat> and at this point, it's much cheaper to take a large block of Carrara marble, drop it on a ship, and send it to China for cutting. Mm -hmm. And when you're in China for cutting, it's dangerous, and there's like a line of people waiting to be the next guy to sit there sawing like crazy trying to get through the marble. Um, so, so it's much cheaper to do, et cetera, et cetera. Not done as well, but the skill of cutting marble is now gone from Italy, from Carrara anyway. Like, like the, the artisans who used to know how to do that, they, they, they lost their jobs. Um, so there's it's tremendous implications for all these things, but bouncing back and forth and um, and it, like our policymakers don't seem to care to address these issues that much. So that's the level at which it would be pretty helpful if somebody said, hey, but wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and it's hard, right, because it's the policymakers, but also like, you know, they do a vote, they do a union vote in the movie, and, you know, and the, the, the workers vote. And so the outcome of the union vote is part of the storyline. Yeah. Um, it's not, I mean, it's, you know, it was at the shop floor that people are making decisions. But it was interesting. I mean, I, I combined this a little bit with the, there's a stuff about, you know, reading a little bit or learning a little bit about, you know, uh, mass, the chicken farms, mass, uh, the, you know, the, the like Cathos, confined animal feeding operations. Yeah. But particularly, and particularly for chickens, right? Because um, yeah. in, in chickens are like ninety percent of the meat that we we produce. It's like I didn't realize the numbers were so um, oh, wow. skewed. So we primarily yeah. are a chicken company, a world or a country, I think. And yeah. um, and the the way the contracts are set up, the farmers have to take out a loan to build the structures, the chicken houses, and then buy the chickens, and then they're able to sell them back at a fixed rate to the companies. And what was interesting to realize is what's happening effectively is that large corporations are able to outsource all the risk. So the farmers handle all of the risk and the companies take guaranteed returns. Um, and I was thinking about how many businesses we've set up that have that structure. So Uber, right? All the risks on the drivers, um, medical insurance, health insurance, right? All the risks on the patients. You know, the, the goal, the business model is to shift the risk to the consumer, to the customer, to the to the to the and other part of the platform. You know? Anywhere so that it's not on the on the company. So it's not on the, the part that the you, shareholder. Yeah. You can also shift it upstream to other companies. That's fine. If you have enough buyer power or if you have enough market power, <clears throat> you can just shift the risk to other people. Um, oh, that's a good example. Yeah. So Walmart is able right. Exactly. Yeah. So you so you squeeze suppliers to the point where they're barely making any profit. And you know, if they stay in if they, if they stay in business great. If not, you turn to a new supplier. Yeah, Rana Fuhar talks about the, is it the financialization of our economy, and that, that sounds very much like that. This, this, every little bit of our economy is being you know, completely, yeah, basically credit swaps. That's a credit swap to the farmer. Hello, you take the risk. It's really like the small farmers in the U.S. have been under siege for a very, 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 very long time in lots of different ways, uh, hundreds of different ways. 
And so it's, it's just a very difficult thing to be, to thrive as a small farmer here in the U.S. Well, it's going to get more Which, I was wondering, why aren't we all, right, Susan, go ahead, sorry. Why aren't we all what? Oh, I thought I interrupted you, Susan, so I was shutting up for a while. <laughs> it's all right. So what about the credit, the, the business roundtable, huh? Business ought to step up. Jamie Dimon and his buddies. And then the B Corp response to it. Come on, that's super, Rexy. Come on. It's good. It's very good. Thank you for doing, bringing us in the conversation and uh, <clears throat> taking us away from the death of, the, from the mass, mass murder of chickens. Um, it's great. And You're I, ruining I, I, my lunch. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, I have a two-thirds finished sort of uh, op-ed-ish piece for Medium about the, the business roundtable decision. And it, the, the piece just keeps growing, so I need to cut a couple pieces out and get it out. Um, but it's, what are you it's, saying? Well, uh, partly my, my, my piece starts with, hey, 25 years ago, I was in grad school, and my roommate, who is the guy, my roommate says, hey, you should come with me and listen to this really interesting guy who's got a seminar. His name is Russell Acuff. <clears throat> and I'm like, oh, okay. Well, whoever, and I go sit down with six people and Russ Acoff, who proceeds to start telling these incredible stories about how things actually work in 10th grade language, but, but completely sort of collapsing and reshaping how I think things work, because he was one of the original systems theorists. And one of his many riffs, and he had a, you know, a million good riffs, but one of them was about stakeholders and how really, really business should be about stakeholders, not stockholders, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, check, got it, perfect. Now what? And that's 25 years ago. And it's like, Man, it's 2019, and the yeah. Business Roundtable finally got around to saying something useful after Larry Fink and a bunch of others have been pounding on them after, you know, there have been lots of interesting people coming out trying to say this thing. And I'm unconvinced that even the Business Roundtable doing, you know, something symbolic like this is going to make that big a difference in the way co corporations are run. Because Wall Street still behaves in the way Wall Street behaves. That hasn't changed because <clears throat> these companies aren't rushing to become B Corps. And I, Dave, I'm not sure I saw, or Bo, I'm not sure I saw the, <laughs> sorry, was it Sue? Who said the B Corp reply? I did. Oh, but oh, sorry. I'm not sure I've seen that. Do you want to put it in the in the chat if you can? Sure, I'll find it. Thanks. Because I, I collected up a bunch of replies, but I don't, I'm not familiar with one from, from B Corp themselves. Um, Todd, any thoughts on this? Well, I I do have thoughts on this, but I, I want to jump back to the, the prior conversation the talking about documentaries and American Factory and I know Dave would probably back me up on this. I highly recommend everybody watch Biggest Little Farm. Huh. Um, it is illuminating. It moved me. Um, it's great storytelling. And it is the anecdote. It, it is the antidote to industrial farming, um, but is a, is a charming story in itself. And, and I think it points to this, this issue of size, too, when you're talking about population explosion. I've often wondered what would happen if there was a progressive tax structure on businesses or employee limitations on businesses um, so that there was disincentives to get too large. Sure, we're not going to stop you from becoming a mega Nash international corporation. Right. <clears throat> um, but you are going to, you're going to pay a price for it. Um, and this issue of size and, and scale, I, I've just been thinking a lot about the global local. And some of, you know, I'm running for city council in my little hamlet of a thousand people. Uh, and it's amazing to see, how local the issues are here you know they're they're talking about individual trees um and the direction of a bike path um and there's people passionate and we're not talking about healthcare availability um and so how you have that mix of this hyper local and the um how do we influence things at the top or top end of the scale is, is, is really interesting to me. And, and I, I do think numbers have something to do with it. 
I'm kind of excited about what you could do in a, in a community of a thousand. We might be able to do something innovative. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for that. Oh, just thumbs up and um, partly begin because I think we, this, uh, I like to think of some things as being scale agnostic. Great. I think, I think social dynamics are sort of, um, uh, they're scale dependent <laughs> for one thing and they, but they're the same dynamics, even in large numbers. Uh, so I don't quite, quite sure where to take that, except that I think the things you're seeing in the local level, well, it's just like there are a lot of zeros at a higher level, right? And many more trees. So the, the, what's going to go on in the meetings may sound very much like what goes on at the Sierra Club, about one tree. Uh -huh. Wow, that's a great analogy, Sydney. Yeah, yeah. I still don't know what that means. <laughs> I've been thinking about it for years. But, um... so, so Todd, you've totally really integrated into your community and have now joined it then. Hmm? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, today is actually my three-year anniversary of moving here. Oh, cool. Man, it's been that long? Yeah. So where do you live? Saugatuck, Michigan. Are you on Lake? Yeah, on Lake Michigan. Wow. So is the town structured like a New England town? Because my in-laws, when they lived in Vermont, you know, they joined up, went to the meetings, and you know, everybody argued about school budget. And my my father-in-law became like the treasurer, did the numbers, and yeah. he was really fun. All this stuff, and he got to really affect change by doing that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a school board that covers uh, three municipalities, um, but the city here, you know, meetings twice a month. Everything is public. Everything's recorded. Yep. Um, and you, as a resident, I opt in to getting the agenda, the payables, the revenue. Every two weeks, I get about 60 pages of data. Wow. So they're pretty transparent and, yeah. and, and happy to communicate. Well, our, yes. Our yes, there's less. ways in which they're not transparent, but they're they're striving towards transparency. Yeah. Yeah, I think to add to this social awareness thing, I think there's a notion of social transparency that goes along with it, which is to, uh, once you're part of a group, you begin to see where the fault lines are. Um, who's in, who's out, who's on the edge, who's this, who's that, all the rest of it. Those things take a while to become apparent and it's easier to hide them in larger numbers of people, mm -hmm. but they're still there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's oops. interesting, we're, we're getting back to the larger numbers of people as well, and, and in the middle of issues of governance, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Bo, you were gonna jump in. Wow, I'm just liking Susan's like Dr. Evil <coughs> stuff this morning, man. I love that bookcase behind you, Susan, that's amazing. Is that built into your house or what? Yes. It's in her office. God, it's her nice. Office. That's my, my, many, my many different subject matters. You should see the house. It has many, many bookcases. I'm ready for that tour anytime you want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. What is Granicus? Granicus sounds like a, a Roman warrior. <clears throat> it's Hail like Granicus. Yeah, I don't know where they got the name. I don't know a lot about it. It's a commercial enterprise that a lot of cities use to do their their archives and stuff. Interesting. But, it's, but the but the archives become a little proprietary, so it's just an interesting uh -huh. kind of, kind of there. You know, Granicus has a lot of control over these archives. So it's it's the kind of stuff that uh, <coughs> public and private. Interesting. Um, one of the sort of big Rexy questions is, what will it take to get people to do more governance with a little g and step away from government with a big G? Um, and this has like lots of implications. Um, one of which is sort of that government with a big G has become a consumer mass marketing exercise where we're right now at the early part, unfortunately, of a real long electoral cycle where <clears throat> a lot of money will be asked for and spent, 
mostly to put ads in front of people and to put, you know, to put spin stories on Facebook and Instagram and whatever, um, which is not, to my mind, what governance is about. It's much more about Todd and his local city council. And, and if Todd and his local city council are talking about, should we chop down the tree that's kind of in the way in the park or that looks a little diseased, but they're not talking about, should we accept some immigrants, you know, from this next migratory wave, is that helping? It is helping in a way in that, in that I'm assuming that you get to know each other and you get to see what's up. I've seen sort of public meetings go really well and go really poorly where some one person just jams everything up and everybody's like rolling their eyes going, you know, there this person goes again. Uh, but it can be very high function. So, so the exercise of doing those things together can prep us for <clears throat> um, times of crisis, times of bigger issues, all that kind of thing. Um, when, this is maybe a, a bad analogy or, or story, but in the, during the Vietnam War, as, um, as the war was wearing on, uh, negotiations started in Geneva. <clears throat> and uh, the American delegation, Kissinger and everybody else, showed up and went to their hotels. The North Vietnamese delegation showed up and rented a house. Um, and, then, and then the parties proceeded to spend a famous year, a year, negotiating the shape of the table and who was going to sit where at the table. And all during this year that was like painfully dragging on, the Vietnamese were like, yeah, we're wa they were watching American media and, and American responses to Cronkite saying this is a quagmire and, and everything else. And, and they knew that they could sort of wait everything out um, and probably get a better deal at the end. <clears throat> um, and they did. It worked really well. So, so part of this question is like, in sometimes, sometimes the actual negotiation isn't in the important thing. Like, like they were using the who's going to sit where at the table and what shape is the table going to have to figure out who had power on the other side of the table. Um, you know how it worked all those kinds of things i don't know <laughs> well yeah. and then there's always um years ago when i was at my first board meeting for the institute for research on learning it was being held at the xerox headquarters and i had not attended a board meeting at that level i suppose ever and i walked into the room and i thought i have no idea where to sit oh interesting and then in our precious one hour with the board, the rest of the guys, and I'm sorry they all were guys, um, spent time talking about what cars they drove. Oh, wow. interesting. It's amazing. It was amazing. I knew exactly what they were doing. They right. were positioning each other, mm -hmm. right? And, and it was interesting because finally the CEO of Xerox says, I drive a Taurus after all <laughs> the fancy cars. <laughs> and Xerox is known as being kind of a, a you know, a blue company. Yeah. Um, he was demonstrating the value. Right. Values. Was this a layer? No, this was a, a Kearns. Report? Okay. Previous CEO. Very interesting. Oh, so, a layer was probably driving something fancy. Yeah, it probably was. You I know, imagine. he went on a motorcycle trip with John C. D. Brown. No. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. And then he got divorced. Oh. I did, a, I did a speech in front of Alaire and the board of Xerox invited in by their CIO a very, very, very long time ago. And who was CIO then? I'm forgetting exactly his name. I've got to remember. Um, and the first sign of trouble <clears throat> was be, the guy before me who was introducing me and also explaining where we were in their planning process, put up a foam core diagram <clears throat> that was maybe a foot tall, but like six feet wide on an easel. And it had a schematic of their planning process. And it was like a, a little arrow, you are here. And it was a two-year planning cycle. And this is in the middle of the internet's birth into public, oh. in, into public view, right? And, I, and, and I'm like, oh, shit. These guys are obeying their two-year planning cycle and na 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 which is probably like, we'll buy them points with, you know, corporate supervision and the board, but they're completely going to blow this. And then... And then I gave an impassioned speech about, you guys helped invent a lot of the, the tinker toy parts of this inner tubes thing, <clears throat> didn't really benefit from a lot of them, but you could lead you know, a whole new renaissance of blah, 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 blah. And at the end, I remember feeling like I had just spoken into an anechoic chamber. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> like my words had just been absorbed by the walls and yeah. the, C the CIO was excited and he says, that was great, thank you so much, we're gonna let And he was, yeah. the, the, the only energy in the room was with the guy who had invited me in. And everybody else is like, whatever. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, it's a little bit like, yes, and it continues. Um, I don't know if you all know Brian Arthur, the uh, sort of renegade um, economist. Um, anyway, at IBM, I hired him in as a, well, brought him in as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, as a consultant and we couldn't find any way to bring him in. So we had to put him through manpower, but he wasn't. <laughs> he came in as a temp through manpower. Yeah. <laughs> he said, whatever works. Cute. That is yeah. completely and he spent a couple of weeks there and he says, you know, the last time I was in a place like this was the, in, in the sixties in Moscow. Uh huh. There was just a, a kind of a weird article about him and Burning Man in the New York times last week. Oh really? Yep. I get my New York times Sunday, New York times. I don't know which part. I can let me yeah. post. I'm, I'll post a link to it right here because I I put it in my brain. <clears throat> oh, I apologize. But my I'm, bookshelves are my brain, and so my, I'm the problem because my brain is, you know, physically located. But and, I go read my as, shelves as it all should all be, time, you know? as it should be. So my apologies. I'm thinking of Paul Romer. It was not about Brian Arthur. Okay. Yeah. Oh yes, I read that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. I thought it was great. Well, it's not quite the, the, the small G government thing, uh, Jerry, but I, I have been wondering, I don't know if anybody's been paying attention to the Trump administration threatening California because of the agreement with the auto manufacturers. Yes. They're, bringing an, they're bringing antitrust against the four automakers. And, and they're, they're actually opening up an antitrust case. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it sounds like they're, I mean, there isn't actually an agreement yet. So yeah. the idea that there's so there is no case yet, but the threat of it. the administration is is trying to derail the, the case right. or the, the agreement. And I guess they, they were already saying like Mercedes is already backed out. Um, you know, so they're oh. it's effective. But I've, I've always tried, you know, like I think Ostrom has the structure for how you do uh, management of a commons. Right. And the government has a role in the management of the commons and kind of holding the vessel a little bit. And I feel like the agreement, you know, it was a pre-competitive agreement amongst manufacturers to try to improve performance. So it, it feels like this is the kind of direction we would like to see government going. Mm -hmm, for sure. And you have the Trump administration deliberately trying to sabotage it um, and for, for reasons that I just, you know, don't really understand. I mean, I'm not even sure what the Trump administration thinks they're getting out of it. But, you, you know, at the very least, you can imagine it's, it's the same pattern they always have, which is the, the bottom feeders have access to the Trump administration, so they don't want high performance, they want sucky performance. And well, because gonna... we have a right to drive as huge a truck as we feel like. Well, and I'm still not quite sure who thinks they're making money out of this stuff, but there's probably somebody out there who's gonna, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's somewhere in the Coke factory or something like that. But anyway, I just think it was, a, it's an interesting, and I guess I do feel like a, a number of these things we're talking about, I'm in the optimistic point of view, which is that this is what California was doing, it was a pretty good idea to do it, the Trump administration's fighting a back guard effort to try to stop it, but the trend is towards this kind of governance and decision making. But I could be wrong. You know? mm -hmm. um, Todd just asked a good question on the chat. And I don't, Bo, I don't know if you've looked at the long term stock exchange much, but would love oh. to, yeah, would love to have your take on it if you have one. Well, I can speak off the top of my head and I'm very. So the most successful companies in the world that have the best performance on actual investment and that don't make dumb short-term decisions worldwide are closely hold family corporations. Um, <laughs> so that's just a fact. Um, uh, so the public companies being run for quote shareholder value just don't really work out. A lot of people don't even realize that American stock market, new companies aren't even funded by the stock market. Capitalization's going down. It's, so anyways, Todd, please speak away. I loved, I, I, yes, I did a little bit about that. But, you know, the best LTSE is a closely held family corporation. It's a great model. I, I, I totally agree with that. And... I see the LTSE if it takes off as being uh, a possible counteracting force against financialization of it overall. Yeah. Actually, actually, I did have a conversation with a uh, an an owner of a business that went from a um, 
investor led business to an employee owned business that employees bought them out. And he said, uh, this is about a month ago. He said a lot of investor led startup companies that are in their middle stage are that leadership is, is secretly talking about um, buying out the investors that it's happening everywhere. I don't know why people would want to be in a public company. The only, <clears throat> the, the reason that maybe bubbles up the most is that you could maybe pump the stock so that it really blows up. Your package would be worth a lot and then you cash out. But everything else about being a public company does not appeal to me. Um, it does not seem to make it easier to manage a company well. It does not, I, all kinds of stuff. I don't, but we have this mania that everybody should go public and become you know, the next, the next uh, unicorn, the next behemoth. <clears throat> and I don't quite get it because, as uh, Bo, as you said, a lot of closely held private companies do really well. But I think I think one of the things that uh, the question for Todd is, what is it about the LTSC um, uh, that you think might be an antidote to financialization? My my experience in a lot of the, the big companies and when they start to grow, I had a particular insider view on. Zurich Insurance, Zurich Financial Services. And um, I finally, and I knew this about insurance to begin with, but there's, to me, there's a money manufacturing industry. That's the financialization part. Yeah, a money and manufacturing industry? Is that what you said? Did you say money manufacturing industry, Susan? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. And so when I think about that, I, I'm interested to why the, closely held family uh, corporations might not be in the, they might be in the money manufacturing business, but they're still in their own business, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. yeah what, so I don't know what the LTSC is gonna, why, why that might be an antidote, but Todd, maybe you could say some more. Well, and, and Bo, correct me if you're wrong, but my understanding is the LTSE doesn't have strict trading rules, um, but they are self-selecting companies that are declaring that we are, we are open for long-term investors, not short-term investors. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's if you're listed there, you're, you're kind of sending a signal to the world as this is what we care about. What I would love is if there was also trading restrictions, aren't it? Um, hmm. Because I think that could also, you know, shift um, the flow of money a little bit. Yeah, you know, what the funny thing is when you think about this is, is now most investing is passive because most investing is BlackRock and the others. Yeah. Just a... a you know, adjusting their index based funds. So the real decision and the real power is if those funds decided to do something about it, you know, if BlackRock you know, and those other guys tomorrow said, you know what, this running just for shareholder value, we're not really up with that anymore. That would matter. Big you, you know, what would be really Rexy is if you couldn't make an investment without shaking someone's hand. Yeah. I like that. That's cool. <clears throat> and looking them in the eye. Yeah. Yes. And you know, another thing about this, Todd, if you look, I posted this thing in the chat about LTESC would encourage long-term investors by asking. Anyways, um, two-tiered um, structures of uh, power of shares. This is all over the place, right? I think even Facebook has that. So, you know, you, you can already see this going on all over the place, actually. This double-tiered, you know, man, uh, share structure where some shares have more power than the others. Isn't Google, doesn't Google have that too? I mean, sure you're seeing this all over the place, really. A lot of companies have created multiple categories of shares so that, so that they can, you know, give away a lot of stock and not be voted out of office, basically. <clears throat> so they retain control over the organization. Does anyone know where the word bank comes from? Oh boy, here we go. I bet you do. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering if anybody else does. Was it's once a guy was selling the blood of children back no, in the no, 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 no. This is a this is a super simple one. It's from the from the Italian or the Latin banca, okay. which is a bench. Which is a bench. <laughs> it's so basically you used to come sit down on the bench, talk about what you needed, shake hands, and walk off with some some funds, <clears throat> yeah. 
or drop off some funds and have them safely stored or whatever. But it was a bench. Banca is bench. You know, there was this great uh, thing on NPR a couple days ago. This guy wrote this wonderful book. I could find it. But what he was saying was essentially, you know, ec economists really, really did got all their dreams came true in the last, you know, 30 years. And Milton Friedman and let's run companies just for shareholder value and everything will take care of itself and the markets will solve everything. And you know what? Absolutely true. We are completely living in that world. The seventies from the eighties on, we have completely seen that. And I, I really, I think the new era that we're all walking into is, well, we've tried that. And, um, <laughs> Income distribution and inequality, that didn't work out, did it, you know? And I still, when you were saying shareholder stuff, Jerry, it still like boggles my mind, but the Germans, right? Every union's also on the board of directors. Employees always had stakeholder representation, right, Jerry? Mm -hmm. You knew that, right? I mean, so. Sorry, say that, you cut out a little bit. Can you say that again? <clears throat> I was doing a whole screed. Damn, okay. Uh, in, in Germany, they already, the, employees are, and the unions as stakeholders are already on the board of directors of the companies there. Yes. Um, in the, it's in the German constitution, it turns out, that any company larger than 30 employees must have labor representation on its board. And I just found the article that um, I think you were referring to that like was great. I, it was a, it's a review of a book. Please put it in. I'll post it on the chat right now. I don't know if, if this is what you were talking about, but it's, it's, it's Benjamin Applebaum, basically a, a, a bit of an excerpt from his new book, The Economist's Hour. That's it. Oh, yeah. Yep. And here's the, here's, it was really excellent. And the book title is The Economist's Hour, <clears throat> False Prophets, Free Markets, and the Fracture of Society. I think that covers it. Yeah, pretty much. And I think it's really interesting to watch. There's another economist, I, I can find the link, that this idea that and it, it makes sense to me that we, we're talking about, so we're spending all this time talking about narrative as a guide to society. And so some of the economists are starting to say, talk about narrative as a guide to economics. And it's like, if you buy into the idea that shareholders are predominant, then you behave that way and you change the direction of society. But it was the narrative that did it, not you know, any kind of underlying physics of econo economics or anything like that. We know that. But I guess I had never heard it translated that way. So I thought it, I thought it was funny to, to think, you know, <coughs> I got to focus on their storytelling capacity. Yeah. 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 Of, Maybe I, you that, Susan, but frankly, you know, I, I just a while ago, I had this guy, I realized that in economics, all our battles between economic theories are really battles about narratives. Yes. About what? They are battles of narratives. That's yes. what it all is. Yeah. yeah. So we had a couple of calls. Um, we had a couple of Rex calls a while ago. I'm looking for, yeah, 2015. <clears throat> what, what are your scripts? Was basically a call we had in 2015 um, about what I, and my, my language for this is that we all have scripts running in our heads that were put there. Um, and I think, I, I, mean, I probably mentioned this way back when, but in the musical South Pacific, there's a beautiful song called You've Got to Be Carefully Taught, <clears throat> which is all about racism. And it's like, we're not born racist, we're taught racism. And uh, so, so we all have a bunch of scripts in our heads. We're mostly unconscious of all these scripts. We don't, we don't know we have them. Um, some of them tell us that those people across the river have green blood and eat their young. Uh, some of us tell us that unless people are in dire threat of starvation, they will not work. Um, some of us tell us whatever, whatever. A lot of these have been manufactured. So if you then go look at the, 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 the history of propaganda, uh, and there's a really good book, uh, Merchants of Doubt, I think is the title. Um, and also Tim Wu, I don't think this is the same book. Uh, there's a couple books that basically we're gonna go into um, how this all works. And it's crazy because a lot of these scripts were invented on purpose. Um, yeah, Merchants of Doubt is not the one, but I'll find Tim Wu's book as well. Um, uh, but he sort of goes into the history of how we were convinced to do stuff. And, and part of it goes back, for example, uh, do you know the Uncle Sam, I want you to join the army kind of poster? Okay, so that goes back actually to Lord Kitchener, because in World War I, they, had, they did the exact same poster with Lord Kitchener pointing out of the poster saying, I want you to join the army. And they got, they expected one million people to show up and, and enlist for World War I. They got three million. 
<clears throat> everybody was like, yep, got to go. It really, really worked. Like patriotism and they had, everybody had romanticized warfare. So nobody was like, oh, they're just going to send us into the mob and the machine guns. No, whole towns signed up and went into reg regiments together. So all the men of a town might get wiped out if this regiment like had a really hard time on the front. All of this kind of stuff happened. So, so these scripts are basically battling for control over what we think, how we evaluate things like public policy, who to vote for, all of that. And, and coming back to what you were just saying about narratives. So I, I see sort of modern in, in, a, in ancient history as repeated battles over the controlling narratives of each era and that these narratives only shift every 300 to 500 to 1,000 years. And Susan, I don't know if you give it different numbers, but, but for me, like the dominant narratives stay dominant for a long time. Well, the, the narrative in economics for, for our society changed in the 80s. I mean, Reagan and Thatcher and all of that happened then. And there, you, there's such a huge dividing line in America. I mean, labor power, labor had power all the way to the 70s and then gone. Right. Yeah. Must and, be a hierarchy of, of narratives, Jerry. Yeah. So Judeo Christianism, Christianity or something, if that's the level. But certainly market based economics is a much more modern phenomenon, if, if that's an important enough narrative. Um, so I've got Reaganomics and then I've got sort of the conservative point of view about how things work. Um, yeah, don't forget <laughs> your good, good buddy, Newt Gingrich. Boy, that guy had an effect. Whoa. <laughs> And he's really smart. Like he, he hacked a lot of these scripts really, really well. Oh, yeah. So, so I, I, I think leaders are not all, leadership is not always a good thing. Some people like Adolf Hitler was a great leader because he launched, you know, Germany and a bunch of other countries into a world war like that. I'm, a, I'm sorry, but that's kind of leadership. So leadership yeah, is not I mean, always. That's the, the thing is that the social dynamics, those are not the place you can change anything because the same ones result in in evil things, <laughs> uh, yeah. bad things, and they, they are also the, the, a force for good. I mean, that, that fact alone should stop us dead in our tracks because so much of the time we, we try to apply the things we thought made things work better at the level of you know, how we operate together and how nice we are to each other and all the rest of that stuff when in fact, um, it works, it works, uh, in both, both directions. This is making me realize, Carletta Perez, does everyone know that book? Yeah. Uh, I love that book. So I read that last year. And there's parts of it, I just, like things that I, I'd never thought of, but as soon as you, I, I, you hear it, like, oh yeah. Like, does everyone know that unemployment insurance was more about being able to extend credit to consumers? Do you understand? Let me explain how that worked. Yeah. Okay needed to sell those damn cars and those bloody house and all those trinkets and things like that and you can't extend revolving credit to people if they lose your job tomorrow and they're not going to have any money you seem to have forgotten that though go on susan <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. so what what i liked about carlotta Perez's book is she pretty much she points out that you know there was a reproach mod from the gilded age of the elites right when you know J.P. Morgan, uh, who's the guy who, you know, Standard Oil, uh, that, that, you know, the, the economy and, and the elites, all these things happened right at the end of the 19th century. And then a depression happened. And then everyone was like, this isn't worth it. This system doesn't work. And so a, a renegotiation between the elites and the pol politicians and the people happened. And that's why what happened in the 50s right after the end of the world war because after the end of the war the elites were scared to death that there was going to be a depression again they thought okay the war brought us out of the depression as soon as this war is over what happens if we're just going to go right back into it <clears throat> so, uh anyway so i really liked how paris she and i love there's so many good points about that book how the dominant narrative society like the way institutions the the idea of mass mass um mass manufacturing like Henry Ford and everything, how Fordism influenced institutions and how people thought about things and how that just seeped into, the narrative seeped into how everything was done and how right now we have a technological change which happened, the microchip like 1972 and you know we're renegotiating, the culture is, is having to re-gear itself or, or, and I really like her perspective and I'm using it in my head all the time by the way. 
um, for in my investing thesis too. I think we have to renegotiate our social contracts. We have to renegotiate like people who are gig workers. Those people are not being taken care of. I mean, there's so much that has to happen and I think it will happen because things, uh, I think a lot of people realize that right now we're not having any inflation. Jeez, I feel like I'm taking everyone's time, I'm sorry. We don't have inflation, we lived off of quantitative easing. Central banks have been printing money and 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 pushing money everywhere. But what we haven't done, and which we, we should have done, like John Maynard Keynes, if he was alive today, he'd be looking at government saying, why aren't you guys like spending a, sh a ton of money? Why isn't there fiscal spending worldwide? Why aren't you guys reinvesting into everything right now? Uh, that's how we don't have a depression because, but we're not doing it. We're in this weird liminal melee's time. And I'm telling you right now, the elites right now are really worried that if the trade war pushes the world economy into a recession with negative interest rates in Europe and everything, you know, it'll basically come down to the governments will finally have to start spending money. And it's it's really exciting time. Anyway, so, okay, that's enough of my screen for today. Why do you think it'll work this time around? Uh, why do I think? <laughs> why do I think it'll work this time around? Because uh, populism, because 0809 wiped out a belief. Uh, populists are winning across the world because. The, the old order and the old promises and how things would work, nobody believes them anymore on the right or the left. That's why. But when, wouldn't you, I mean, like, again, the optimistic take, Bo, Bo that wouldn't you argue that the popular, like the, like the battle has been engaged in some sense? I mean, already, yes. In Italy, Mexico. Italy. Which battle do you mean? The populist. Yeah. Whether the populists, I mean, if you mean by populists, you mean the Trumpists. I get really confused because there's authoritarian populism and then there's like honest things that come from the people. And I'm like, those things are opposite ends of my mental spectrum. Why do they both get called populism? Yeah, well, I, it seems like a lot of good words get co-opted. <laughs> Don't they? It's crazy. There's an idea of populism that, that the, the established narratives on the left and the right, both of them don't, aren't believed anymore. Like, right, Bernie Sanders on the left, Trump on the right. To me, they're both manifestations of, hey, the way this used to work, we don't believe you anymore. Okay, as far as I want to go, I want someone to correct me or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. I went to this uh, conference a little bit this week called uh, Soil Not Oil in San Francisco and I was looking for regenerative <laughs> agriculture kinds of folks and stuff and there were a bunch of them there and it's interesting but it was also like just you know like I'm you know like a public policy kind of Washington DC kind of nerdy wonky kind of orientation and these were folks who were a little bit more extreme on their politics so it was like I was realizing regenerative agriculture and this connect community was also connected to um, 5G is going to kill us uh, GMOs are bad uh, vaccines are bad um, and it was, you know, a little unclear as to kind of how strong those threads ran through the community. But I was like, I was like, whoa, I'm not so sure I'm supposed to be in this community or not, you know, uh, around this sets of ideas. And the 5G stuff in particular, it's like, I have no idea if 5G is going to like destroy our DNA or not. But, and I don't even know how to figure out whether I should be worried. About it. Right. But it was an, it was an issue at this uh, conference. Internet of Things is bad. Yeah, well, maybe it's because the Chinese control it and they'll be able to monitor us and it's part of the surveillance state, right? I, for one, welcome our new robot overlords. <laughs> yeah. Uh, everyone needs to check out Jerry's brain for the conservatives model and then switch over to the liberals model. This is pretty fascinating. And that's, a, so that's the stuff out of um, moral politics from George Lakoff, <clears throat> I'm looking, I've been desperately scanning around because I've got another little nexus that's, that's equally as interesting, but I'm not finding it. I'm finding a bunch of treasure troves here, but not the one I'm looking for, which is weird. Ooh, I love morality is like accounting. Ooh. Yeah. And I want to get the left one. Where's the left one? That's conservative. <clears throat> yeah. uh, it, there should be a jump thought. Uh, it should be off to the side, a parallel with. Uh... Okay, liberal model, I found it. Yep, sorry. Yep. Empathy, fuck that. Uh. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
And then I, I have a thought called conservative memes, which is interesting, but it's not the thing we're thinking about. This is kind of language created on purpose. <clears throat> um, this is language created on purpose to win political battles. So this is, this is kind of the battle over the messaging and the narratives. So tax and spend, liberal elites, the death tax, death panels, anchor babies, cap and tax, crisis actors, <clears throat> you know, uh, all those kinds of things are, are, are language intentionally created uh, to win stuff. And Fred Luntz is kind of the, the master of that. Dangerous to deviate? Okay, I got it. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, it's so frightening, Gary. Oh, it's so up there. Frank Luntz, sorry. Um, yeah, this is all, yeah. Well, Elizabeth Warren, let's talk about her a little bit. So okay. she's up there, right? She's, she's, she's a technocrat, um, you know. Uh, I'm really surprised why Bernie doesn't seem to have the juice right now. What's going on? I like Bernie because I want <laughs> to hear the hell out of the elites. Because I, well, the way I look at Americans' political system, the Senate holds anything back. So I want the most extreme left to just slam into the American political system. Because it seems to me it's going to take that for anything to happen. Yeah, but to be suppressed by the Democrats right now. There's a really there's a there's a, a titanic conflict going on right now. Um, debates like, does does the American voting public want something extreme and interesting? Do they actually want a human with a plan, a good radical plan, or do they just want somebody who's a break from Trump and who is reliable and trustworthy and will like navigate through these tough waters? And those are two completely different candidates. The, the latter is Amy Klobuchar <clears throat> and the former or Hickenlooper or a couple other people that are saying she, her, her tagline is I'm the pragmatic progressive. Um, and then on the other end are Bernie and a bunch of others who've got like way out their plans and Bernie released a $17 trillion plan to do a whole bunch of stuff. There's uh, AOC's Green New Deal, which I thought originally when I heard about it, I'm like, oh, there should be a total business plan around green and, and renewing the economy. No, 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 the Green New Deal is job guarantees and a whole bunch of other stuff. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's much more like the New Deal than a Green New Deal. Yep, it's very old fashioned, yes. Yeah. Um, and so, and so I, I don't know. I, I think that people are thirsting for a big plan, like for big ideas that, that tackle this well, um, not a caretaker, because Hil Hillary was a caretaker and they did not elect her. Anybody else uh, have a different sway, a different pick, take on this? Because because we're going to keep whittling down Democratic contenders until like there'll be a couple standing, <clears throat> and they're going to fall on one side or other of the. I mean, you know, Hillary, Hillary didn't get elected, kind of argument because I mean, in some sense, she did, and um, you know, it was a, it was it was a it was a really an, a real anom anomaly looking at the numbers and stuff that he, she isn't the president, right? Well, so Trump, Trump, to an in, Trump to an inside straight on the Electoral College, yes. Yeah, so I mean, trying to interpret then, that there's some meaning to the fact that Hillary lost seems a little bit of a stretch. Um, so I, I think it was a random act. Um, but, um, and then the other side is, I do feel like, I mean, you know, I'm so angry right now, but the, 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 the Republicans, you know, uh, kind of running the table have, have, I feel like gone too far, right? They, they kind of revealed the truth about themselves in many ways. Mm -hmm. right? And it's like all the things that used to be sacrosanct aren't anymore. And, you know, it's like whatever Trump says is fine and everybody's going in line. And that that creates this opportunity for a, a radical shift. So I, I don't think it's a policy shift. It's a philosophic shift of some sort. You know, or it's, you know, the world could be better or something. We really could make America great again, I guess. And so it's, it's like it's an opportunity for a large change and if you only do an incremental change, that would be a, a lost opportunity. Right. <clears throat> Anybody else with strong feelings about how this plays out? I think quietly <clears throat> and efficiently, as Elizabeth Warren is, like she's methodical. Yeah. Um, is she is building community. And I, I, um, I don't think that's getting a lot of press because it's not the same type of optimism dri driven Obama type. Um, but I, I think her rise is, is, is largely having to do with, you know, she's, she's got her shit all worked out. Yeah. 
<clears throat> I, I have to say, I took great pleasure in watching her like um, spank CEOs in the Senate, basically, <clears throat> um, because everything she said was like right, and uh, her her indig her moral indignation rooted in principles and actual facts is a delight in that setting for me. <clears throat> it's also horrifying for at least a third of this country, <clears throat> right? They don't want they don't want somebody to come lecture them and point their finger at them necessarily. <clears throat> so, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how this plays because people who meet her say that she's incredibly authentic and warm personally. Um, April had her as a professor um, at law, in law school. So April took either constitutional law or something like, or contract law from Elizabeth Warren. <clears throat> so knows her personally and thinks very, very highly of her. Um, and let's say she becomes the nominee, who's the other half of the ticket? And how do you balance it and all that? I mean, there's lots of interesting questions there. I did not know that about April. That's a really interesting thing to know. Hi. Did she become an attorney? Pardon? Yeah, she's a, she's a lawyer and passed the bar and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Still keeps up her California bar, I think. Send her back. <laughs> what, to California? Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> or whatever shit little place she came from. I know. Um, anyone want to put any other topic on the table for we have a couple minutes before we should wrap? <clears throat> um, anything else in our heads and hearts about... Uh, the relationship economy and trust and similar sorts of things. I don't know, maybe. I mean, I would love to. I'm still kind of my flavor of the week uh, or two weeks now, Jerry, is this idea of uh, you know some kind of a book or something around mass collaboration, right? Um, and kind of revisiting what we know about mass collaboration. Post, um, did you already post the link to the doc here in the chat? Just post it again in case anybody's interested. Yeah, let me try to find it. So um, go ahead. No, and I just kind of. I mean, I, I guess I was. I was struck. I had had a conversation. I was talking with this guy at the at the Well Being Alliance, which is a consortium of kind of new economy type groups, and they're talking about how do they do? You know, essentially they had a knowledge sharing problem, I think, and they want to build a platform for knowledge sharing so that people can find the best new economy things. And and we were, you know, and I was kind of saying, well, none of the stuff you're talking about will work. We've been trying it for a long time. That's not going to do anything good. And he says, well, right. why? One of the questions he had was, why didn't? Why don't wikis work? And I. It's like, I actually don't, I don't know, you know, because I'm still kind of walking around talking about how, what an exciting thing Wikipedia is. But 20 years later, it's like, it's the only one. Yeah, right? <clears throat> yeah. And it kind of, it was making me realize that there is like 20 years later, what do we know about mass collaboration? I was even thinking from this conversation that, that we've ended up at this interesting hierarchy, like at the very highest level of collaboration, these massive narratives are what organize us probably, you know, there's, there's, there's a lesson in there, I think. Right. Um, but at the lowest level of kind of like, why doesn't a wiki work? We also have a lot of details around like, well, it works but here's a, here's, hmm. Yeah, please, Susie, I, I just, I'm finding this interesting. <laughs> no, I, I have a question there because, um, um, you know, maybe, maybe, um, and I don't usually like to play the power card, but I will, maybe it's the, uh, it's the it's a small number of people who are actually running things at that giant narrative level. I mean, those are not the stories I people I know tell each other. They're not even, not even aware of the economy. Right. And um and I and it's a small and it's a small dynamic, right? And who is it? It's people who have power. And what kind of power? Well, political power, economic power, whatever kind of power. A whole bunch of it is concentrated. Um, and so I think the dynamics are the same there. It's a small group. Try to get into that group. I mean, not so easy. Yeah, not so easy. And, and those, those groups that win, in quotes, meaning, <clears throat> meaning their narratives become the dominant narratives for quite a while, that's usually the end of a really long struggle and lots of politics and yeah. lots of strife yeah. and lots of other things, right? So, yeah. I mean, and, Elizabeth Warren yeah. is not going to be part of that. Yeah. And I'm wondering, like, what is the right antidote to Trumpism? Is it earnestness? Is it <clears throat> simply honesty and reliability? Is it calm? 
or is it coming back at him with a similar kind of approach yet a different a different way of doing it right just leave him out of it i'm tired of seeing his name oh man ironically a couple of people recently read we're going to miss him when he's gone like because it, because every day the news is like your 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 most popular reality tv show run amok yeah <clears throat> Crazy times. Crazy. Well, I got to go because I got to be ready for the lawyer talk, okay? All right, cool. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, very nice to hear what's in your minds. And, uh, and uh, let's be Rexy out there. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.